Hello. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm Mitch Braff, the Executive Director of JPEF, the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation. Welcome to our first live partisan webcast. We're very excited to be in the home uh, of Sony Orbach in Marin County, California, where we are going to momentarily, you will have the opportunity to ask her questions. Um, and we'll also be playing this on our, on our YouTube channel tomorrow at 5 o'clock at www.youtube.com slash Jewish Partisans. Um, we'll be taking questions at two ways. You can send us via Twitter at uh, hashtag JPEF webcast or email webcast at jewishpartisans.org and we'll answer as many questions as, as, as possible. Um, most of you hopefully have tuned in to our, our website, jewishpartisans.org, where you've read the study guide we have on Sonia Orbach, the short biography. We have several, several video clips and short films that feature Sonia that will give you some background information before you ask her questions. I, before I talk a little bit more about Sonia, I want to put a plug in for our writing contest. The deadline has extended to May 10th of this year. And this is focused on Jewish women partisans, including Sonia Orbach. So after this program, you might be able to be inspired and write about Sonia if you wish. When the Germans invaded, her brother Meyer escaped to join the partisan resistance. Sonia and her parents escaped to the forest, surviving the brutal cold and starvation. Guided by her uncle, Herschel, a formal ar army scout, Sonia and her parents eventually joined the partisans. Her uncle and brother were killed in combat. Sonia's mother died of typhus shortly before the end of the war. Most of the rest of her family and friends were murdered during the Holocaust. Yet Sonia and her father survived. Following the liberation of Poland, Sonia married fellow Holocaust survivor Isaac Orbach and eventually immigrated to the United States. Today she has two children and a 19-year-old granddaughter. She wrote a moving memoir about her experiences titled, Here There Are No Sarahs. We are honored to speak with her today from her home in Northern California. First of all, we're going to take a short clip um, of a video from Sonia from one, one of our films that is available on our, on, our, on our website, and then we're going to bring Sonia out. Please roll the clip. People did not go only like sheep to their death. People were fighting every which way they can. There is such a thing as fighting back. This is the way I think. That's why I'm sitting here to give you, give you the interview. Why else would I do it? I want the people to know that we were fighting. Okay, Sonia, thank you again for coming and letting us into your home. You're very welcome. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, dozens of, of classrooms all over the country tuning in, listening to you now, and uh, it's very exciting. So I'm going to ask a couple questions that I have prepared, and, then, and then, then what we're going to do is that we're then going to have questions from students and classrooms all over the country. I'm always happy to talk to students. Well, thank you. Let me ask you one question is... When, tell me what it was like when you came into the partisan camp for the first time. I mean, you were hiding in the forest, living, it sounds like, in a, in, in a hole, basically, for a long time. And when you came to the partisan camp and they had food and fires and other people, what was it like? When I came there, I did not believe they're going to take me in, the way we looked, hungry and dirty and so on. But they took us in for some reason. The reason was my uncle, Herschel, was uh, in the Polish army. He was a scout, and they needed a scout, so they took us in. Otherwise, we were four people, hungry and dirty, but I'm glad they took us in, and life was quite different, uh, of course. Uh, the first impression was 
my God, people are living normally. They're cooking and they're washing laundry. They're doing things we didn't do for some time. So I was happy to be there. Maybe we were greeted very nicely by the commander and so on. Um, when I know when you got there um, and you had a conversation with the commander's wife, um, I don't think they knew. I don't think they knew. The, the commander's wife took me into her own um, tent and she gave me some lessons of life, which I didn't have any. I opened my eyes very wide. I didn't know what she was talking about. She said, Sonia, if you want your life to be a little better, and the partisans, you must decide and, and, and decide to, to talk and be friendly to commanders and so on. To me, this was totally new. To do, I mean, you had older brothers and you were the kind of the baby in the family, weren't you? I was the baby, the only girl I was spoiled by my two brothers, especially the oldest one which was taken in to, was mobilized to the Russian army, and he never returned, and he was a darling of my life. But this was life. When was the last time you saw your brother? When did they take him into the army? Is in uh, 40... 1940. No, they took him in before the war started, the Russian army, in 1940, 41, I think. I'm not so, so clear with the dates now. Um, is there a time um, when, and then when you got to the partisans, what was your job, what was your mother's and your father's job, and what were you supposed to do? Uh, nobody really assigned anything to you, to me, because I was considered a younger person of 17. And, um, but my mother was assigned to be a cook for the hospital and for the sick. So, of course, I worked with my mother together. And, um, and my father was assigned to get us some food in the villages. So that was his job. And my job was not, not specifically assigned anything, but I worked with my mother. I helped her, whatever she had to do. Um, is there... Um, I know that you were not... Tell me, I know that you did participate in actions. Um, I know that you were in the Battle of Kobol mm -hmm. um, for one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Can you tell me what was the Battle of Kobol and how you got involved and what happened to you? Uh, I was assigned to have to go there with the, with the group of people, the group of partisans, and to do whatever was necessary for them, like feed them and uh, admitting uh, medical help as much as I could. And um, this was my job, let me tell you. It's a job which I will never forget because I was young. I was not medically trained. And uh, after they went into a fight, you had many wounded people and some people without legs, some people with with a little arm or something like that, and you had to help them. You didn't even have proper bandages. The bandages that I had, I had to be washed from other sick people, which I took and used for the, for the, uh, for the newer wounded people. It was dreadful. Did you, um... So you're saying, so you, but you had to rewash, you had to rewash the bandages when they were done. Is that and what were um, did I mean? At one point, were you um, were you were I mean, were were you scared? I mean, did you think that you possibly? Of course, I was scared. Look, you take a a girl from before the war. It's not the girls now, seventeen years, 
the girl. I was, I was never out in the world. I never saw anything other than a movie in the theater, and I didn't know anything. Of course, I was frightened, and uh, but you had to hide your feelings if you wanted to survive. You you had to hide your feelings. You had to accept what they tell you to do, and I did. Were, were there people who weren't able to hide their feelings? I mean, that you. That how did you learn to hide your feelings? Well, I was with my predominantly with my family, with my parents and my uncle, my uncle Herschel. So I don't know what other people felt or did. I know that I couldn't say no, I wouldn't do it. Because first of all, I was afraid of my own life, not only my own. I was afraid my parents' life there, they might tell them to go somewhere else. And I knew the war was on. So we stayed quietly and we did whatever they told us to do. But, um, at one time, there is a quote that you said, um, and I, you wrote about, you said, I didn't even bend down my head. I wasn't worried that I was going to get killed. What, what was, what was that situation like? What were you feeling at that time? Uh, the situation was, we were escaping from our town. The town was burning, and we were escaping with a f horse and wagon, and we had to cross. Uh, uh, a line of uh, where the trains are running and the trains were coming and we had to cross and that's when I said I uh, I wasn't afraid of my life I didn't even bend down my head when they were shooting and the, and the, the shooting was going around my head over my head and I didn't bend down. I didn't, was not afraid I'm going to be dead, to die, or wounded. Somehow life becomes meaning, meaningless then. Right. It's, um, we have a question here from a Devin Day's English class in Long, Beach, in Long Beach, California. They said, what kept you going during the years you served as a partisan? What can you what? What kept you going? Sorry, I don't understand. What kept you, what, I mean, at times maybe you wanted to, you know, did you ever want to give up? Did you ever, why did you keep on fighting? Why did you? Never, no such thing as giving up, never. We had to fight on, we had to live, and to see the end of the world and to show that Hitler did not win by destroying us totally. Um, it's, um, and I want to see that there's, you know, we have um, a question um, that you also talked about that even though life was dangerous, you said it was a picnic compared to life on the, on, b before your journey, journey. What do you mean by that? Because simply when we were in the ghetto just before we came out to the forest, there was no food, there were... So many people, we lived in one kitchen, one room in the kitchen of 16 people, including some children. So life was not easy. And uh, in the partisans, you lived free. They give you a tent. Actually, when we came into the partisans, we received a tent for our family, a family tent. So in the evenings, when uh, the young people, some from Warsaw, some from Lublin, some from all over, came into our tents to discuss politics. And that was a break from the dark routine that we had every day. Tadin, what do you remember talking about when you were in the tent? The war. The war, no, no politics, no presidential, presidential politics. We talked about the war, about the second front, when the second front will come. 
then we have a chance that we'll survive. By second front, they meant the English and the French joining the war. To make a difference. Excuse well, me, talk a little loud, that's hard for me. One, one of the, we're going to show a clip in a minute, but first I want to ask you a question we have, it looks like from uh, another student. Can you talk more about your escape from the ghetto and some of the people who helped your family? Because you were really helped by uh, Tejon. Tejon. Yes. And could you talk about what, how Tejon helped your family? Okay, escaping from the uh, <clears throat> from the ghetto was not easy, but at night, you know, somehow on my stomach and knees and elbows, we we came out little by little near the mill, the flour mill, and uh, we escaped to the village of Nudeshe. It's it's a village where my mother stemmed from. And um, we came running. First of all, we didn't have water for, for two days, maybe. And the first thought and the first will was to have some water to, 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 to be able to turn my tongue. My father ran ahead of time to find uh, a place where we could fill ourselves with water, but nobody was able to get close to that, uh, to the place where watering was possible because the dogs and the people chased us and they called Jede, meaning these are the Jews. So we kept running and we ran, and it was some places where it was maybe raining or something. There was a little green, it's not water really, it's a mixture of dirt and water. So my father had a little of those hats, so he took that water and that dirt into the head and gave us all to have a little moisture in our mouth. And from then, we ran to the f young forest of Nadezhe and we rested there from running. And uh, then Tehon came out from the forest and he said, go in deeper into the forest and I will help you. I'll bring you some food. So at first we didn't trust them. We thought it's, it's something they're going to kill us. Because at that time, if you killed the Jew, you got uh, a, a kilo sugar or something for killing a Jew. So. Uh, Let me ask, who, who was, who was Tihon? And why did you think he, he, he helped you? Tihon was a very poor peasant, a peasant who spent some time in prisons for stealing a bread or whatever. He had a family, but she could not provide enough food for them. And he was so kind, absolutely kind. When he looked at me, at my feet, which were burned from sitting close to the fires, he cried, actually cried. He says, I'm going to make you some shoes out of straw. And he did. <laughs> it's like slippers. He brought some shoes made out of straw. And every time he came, he brought something and he cried. And he said, well, I can see the older people already did bad things, maybe. But you had no time to do bad things. Why do you have to live like that? He was a very kind, very kind man. He was a peasant, and again, he worked hard to provide for his family. And he took pity on us. And he, 
And he gave you food, right, when you were in the forest? He, he gave me food as much as he can afford. There, his wife baked pierogi with beans and and other things, and they brought out, let's say, every Sunday they brought out a pail of pierogi. You know what that means? Oh, now, you'll never know. <laughs> so, uh, and on top of that, he used to do a little bit of um, vodka, provi uh, driving this vodka, what do you call that? And he used to bring me a little bit of vodka, I never knew what it was. But he kept a little bottle for us because the winters were very, very cold. And he said, maybe the vodka will keep you a little warmer. Very, a very kind person, very kind. It's unfortunate that his life did not turn out the way. I, I'm thinking to myself, if I would see Tichon alive, I would wash his feet and drink the water, as they say in the Bible. But he was extra, extra good and nice. After all, we were four people. Four people, you had to provide something to eat, whether it's a potato, whether it's a slice of bread once a week or something like that. Well, the horn is deep in my heart. Did, so you never had a chance to thank him? Excuse me? Did you ever have a chance to thank him? after that, during the, when he left? Oh, he didn't have an easy life because he was sent to prison. He was sent to prison for 12 years, I found out from the children, for being a nationalist, I think. So I, I thank the family till this day, I'm thanking the family. That's I provide cows for some of the members of the family and send occasionally money and um, they know they have a friend in me if they if they have some needs they should call and ask for help that's wonderful and then tell me when you were i mean describe where you were in the forest before you joined the the russian partisans what was your what was it like? What was your accommodations like? Because you were living outside in basically a small... Well, the, the Park Avenue accommodations. Okay. The accommodation is whatever you made. You know, uh, you... Uh, you had nothing. No clothes, no shoes, nothing. So you had to make provisions for it. You begged in the village and you got the, a little help from the villagers, you know, some bread or something like that. Well, it wasn't easy, as you know. No, no. Um, we got another question from a class in, Lo in, Long, Beach, in Long Beach, California. It says that we all associate smells with times in our lives. Um, you know, outside, the smoke. Are there any, when you think of, when you smell something, does it, does it ever bring you back to the time in the partisan? Baked potatoes. Baked potatoes? Did Till this day, we love baked potatoes. And the skin has to be hard. And my uncle was a specialist in baking the potatoes. And uh, that's the smell I remember. Other than that, no. Um, what else, besides the potatoes, what else did you, you say that, you know, when you're in the partisan group, what else did you eat? In the partisans? In the partisans. Lepioshka. You know what Lepioshka no. is? What it's is it? like um, a little pizza, but without the toppings. And you cook these every day or every second day for everybody and this is was like bread you know uh, something like bread were i know did your family consider uh keeping kosher or trying to be a, in terms of uh keeping what keeping kosher eating only kosher till this day i have a kosher home and in the partisans the partisans if i got um, a gift a little bit of Pork, I gave it away. I didn't touch it. 
Well, that's incredible. So and the to... meat and the soup I spit out. Why was it important for you to keep kosher? I was brought up that way. I didn't know any other way. I thought if I don't keep kosher, something terrible is going to happen to me. Okay. Did you? All right. Well, we are. Um, um, well, let me ask you: how, Are there other ways that you were able to keep your Jewish identity? Um, you know, did besides ke keeping kosher, did you acknowledge any Jewish holidays? Were you able to do anything else? to acknowledge your Jewishness. You're talking about present in, time? In, in the partisans. Partisans, no. But keeping kosher was very strong? No, I didn't keep kosher in the partisans. Whatever was given to me, I spit it out. Yeah. And the only thing we could get is a piece of, piece of lepioshka, a piece of bread. Right. All right, well, we're going to show a clip um, from uh, an interview we, we, we did with you, and then we'll ask you some more questions. Please roll the clip. 40 below zero, 30 below zero. It's tough. You cannot tell, hold your gun in your hand because the hand freezes to the gun. Tough. My legs were burned completely because it was so cold. When we sat in front of the fire, I did not feel that my flesh was burning my legs. It was a, a horror. Okay, so what, one of the questions that we, we have was actually also here in California, um, in Sunnyvale, um, from Kahila Jewish, Jewish High School. Um, someone actually writes, Sonia, I want to ask you, because you were a partisan with the, she says she was a part, she wants to ask you because you were in the Russian partisans. She wants to, so I'd like to express my admiration towards your bravery and astonishing courage. I generally am very interested in Russian side of the war because I was raised very Russian and always idealized Russians in the war based on heroic images I saw them in books and movies in my childhood. So I would like to know your perspective. Did you encounter any anti-Semitism from the non-Jewish Russian partisans, even as a slight, a noticeable barrier? So was it difficult? I'm going to speak about the Polish. When I went to school, the principal used to come into the classroom and said, Pretch the Palestinian, means go to Palestine. This was a principal of school. And uh, that we, we got upset about it, but what could you do? We didn't have a country yet. That's why it was so important for us in 1948 to vote Israel in for a country because we knew once we have a country they're not going to say pledge the Palestinian. Okay, what else do you want me to answer? To do, could, could you, so in terms of what about the, what about the Russians? Were the difficult being in the Russian partisans? Um, I know one of the things they tell you that the, the title of your book, which is wonderful, that I hope everybody hearing my voice and seeing us reads it, here there are no Sarahs. Could you talk about the title of your book and what that means? Okay, it means um, it should have been Sura Sheinwald, but when it came, the Russians told me there are no Suras. So, Sonia, I had to, to become Sonia Sheinwald. And... Um, Really, I did not feel such great anti-Semitism in the Russian partisans. You did not? No, I didn't. I remember one incident, one of the, um, the mining group, we had different groups for mining, different groups for other things. From the mining group, he came and presented me a beautiful knife. And uh, I didn't want to take it. I'm going to take a knife from him. What did he want of me? So when I came back to my mother and I told her the story, she says, you better go and take that knife. I said, why? I couldn't understand. And she says, because it will be considered uh, something that you have against them and you don't want even to accept a knife. 
ai să se vor mai spăsă de umadă și să zvigone nit, maybe sax or gloves în reciprocă ai dat vei. And that's what there was one um uh so you basically um there was I know a, a Russian young man that you were that 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 you liked and that he wrote a, a wonderful letter to you that I know that you still have. Um how was it tell me about how you met him and was it was this um This is a young man, a young boy that you liked, that you were attracted to. And how, what was it like to see someone like that in the forest? Well, his uh, name was Piotr Minakir, and he stemmed from Minsk. And he found us out. Apparently his Jewishness told him to go and help us some, as much as possible. And he was in the reconnaissance group So he traveled all over and he could bring the news what's going on all around. And he was a very, very nice man, very intelligent. He was a, uh, an accountant or a bookkeeper just before he went into the partisans. So he used to come and talk to, talk to us evenings. And it was very pleasant. And... Uh, But he did not survive. He went on a mission. He never came back. Were you able? I'm so sorry about that. Were you able to have time with him, you know, privately? I mean, not. I mean, just. Or were your parents always there? I mean, not you. Would... <laughs> I knew you would come to that. Ah. My parents were always there. <laughs> yes. And we was. I was brought up to be a good girl, a good Jewish girl. So. No hanky pink. <laughs> um, how did you feel about the Russian partisans in general? I mean, how do you feel about the Russians today? I looked up to them. I knew that they are very helpful in the war, and uh, I really looked up to them. Um, and, and is it that? And I know that. Um, And one and one thing I wanted to to clear up about Tihon earlier is: Did you ever see Tihon after liberation? Tihon, unfortunately, he was sent to prison for twelve years, and he did not survive. And they didn't even the Russians didn't even want to give the body for burial for the family. So there you go. I didn't see him, but uh, I saw his family, his wife, his daughter. Yes, but not to her, unfortunately. Sure. No, I um, wanted to then clarify. So, Tihon, tell us how you then got in, you made your way into the Russian partisan group. Didn't Tihon tell you there was a group and they were looking yeah. for... Tihon said there are partisans in the vicinity, he says, but I don't know whether they're Jew-friendly. Jew so by that time, we had no choice. We didn't have where to go anymore, where to hide. And he says, there are partisans, but I couldn't tell you they're Jew-friendly. Jew so and nevertheless, he, we said, go ahead, make an appointment. He made an appointment with the commander, And we went in to went in to meet that commander. Can you believe the look, the way we are, dirty, full of lies? And uh, and the commander came out and questioned us for a while. Where are your guns? How many trains did you rid the rail? Well, we didn't. So that was all the questioning we had, and they took us in because of my uncle, who was, uh, he was, um, I can't think of the Shit. word, a scout, and they needed a scout. So that was the reason they took us in, otherwise they wouldn't, we didn't, we didn't have any guns, we didn't do anything for the war. So anyway, 
when the partisans already, I felt relief, like I'm going, maybe I'll go, sur I'm going to survive. Maybe it's going to be good because we did not believe anything or anyone anymore. When you got, however though, when you were in the group, um, if I remember right, soon afterward, um, your uncle was killed in a battle on a, on a, on a mission. And, and now that you would think the Russians would have no use for you and your family, why, tell me about how you found out he was killed and why you think they let oh, you stay my uncle, the Your uncle. My uncle. Well, they went into, um, for a mission. And you know how the, the, the forests weren't always deep, tall forests. Some of them are young and, and not as tall. And uh, he went on a mission, and there was a fight, and uh, they, he was wounded in the fight. And they were yelling at him, he should lie the flat, but he did not do that. He got up and he was killed. But I want to tell you one thing, you should, and this is worth mentioning. After my liberation, my father's liberation, he knew exactly where his body was. And he went there with a group of Russian soldiers and he dug out. It, it just happens today I have yard site. You know what the yard site is. Tell the people who don't know what a yard site is. Excuse me? Tell, so I know, but some other people watching this may not know. What is a yard site? We celebrate the uh, the day that we found that he died every year we remember we light a candle which i have to do now and in memory of this i have a yard site after my uncle and after my mother that's it this whole month is yard site mm, so sorry um getting Talking more when you were in the Partisans, how did it feel when you first realized that you now had a chance to fight back against the Germans and the others who were, who were trying to kill you? And I you was elated. I was happy. I was grateful to God that he allowed me to, to, to come to a place and time where I could see some death on the other side. And um, what else can I tell you? That's all we had is, is fight the fighting back when it's possible. We couldn't do much fighting without an army. Is there, how do you think the partisans were sick? Why, what things kind of missions did the partisans do that were successful? Okay, derailing the trains. Why was that? Tell me they, why the was trains that? were running with weapons and with food to the front, which was on the, on the east. And uh, derailing a train meant that the German army will not be fed well. It meant they will not get the medication on time. So that was a very important thing to do. And how did the partisans blow up the, I mean, what was it like? Did we, were you ever on a mission or, or when they? I did not do the mining, but yeah. I came with a group of mining and I saw exactly how it was done. How did they do it? <laughs> they took the mine carefully. People who were trained to do it, very carefully they took the mine dug a little bit of a uh, ravine and put the mine in and try to cover it very lightly, not touching very deeply, just, you know, I've, I've been, uh, I've seen some people blown apart by touching the mines. Mm -hmm. So that was something which not too many people did. Sure. And the people who did were trained, but sometimes not too well. Right. 
We got a question from uh, George Hedgepath at Atlantis Alternative High School in Flint, Michigan. And he wants to ask, you know, how did you get the mines and other resources? You know, how did they, how did you get the mines to blow up the trains? Okay. You get the mines from some other partisan groups who were able to obtain them different ways, stealing and robbing and all that. So this is the way it was obtained. Yes, that's a good question. Um, and what about other resources? What were other important things you needed to fight back against the Germans? Okay, that was the uh, Ukrainian nationalist Bulbovtsi. And they were against the Jews too. And so we had to worry about them too. In fact, many a times we went in for something else and they fought us, they, uh, they started fighting. And, uh, and we had to fight back and it wasn't easy to fight the Germans and to fight the Ukrainians. At the, but what, like, where did you get the other, the weapons? Um, yeah, you, you talk, you, know, how, how, you talked about, um, did you get supplies from, from, from Moscow? How did you get the, the resources to fight the Ukrainians? Okay, good, the, good question. We did get some uh, help from Moscow. Uh, we uh, we had some planes coming in with weapons and taking away very sick or wounded people. And we knew exactly when the planes are coming in, we used to light a fire on the round so they would know where to land. And um, they brought in some food, some weapons, main, mainly weapons. And uh, that's how we got our provisions and think. In fact, they, my parents were considered elderly people. They wanted to take my parents into Moscow, leave them there, but because, so I could remain quietly and the partisans. But my parents refused. Mm -hmm. The only child, they're not going to leave the only child. Sure. Um, let's show another clip. We're going to show another clip and we'll give some classes more time to, to I think can, of. I we're, can. We're, we're going to show a, a video clip from you talking from an earlier interview and this will give classes some time to answer questions. Why don't we show a few minutes at the beginning of Women and the Partisans? To, to show that, we'll show a, this is, and this really ties into our essay on writing, our essay contest on writing about Jewish women partisans. Please roll the clip. I was the girl who played soccer with the boys. I was the girl who rode the bicycle on the street with, in shorts, which another Jewish girl didn't do that. See, I was born a fighter. I am free. I was always free. When I was a child, my father used to say that I am dangerous. <laughs> In the Second World War, approximately 30,000 Jews escaped ghettos and work camps and formed organized armed resistance groups to fight the Nazis. These groups were known as partisans, and within their ranks were thousands of women. The German soldiers came in to our town. It's like the noise of the motorcycles, and, and uh, it was so overwhelming. So we, of course, we found out then that this is the end. This is the way it was. We lived in fear all the time. All the time we lived in fear. And, um, and the young men, the young, the young people in town, especially the young boys, somehow tried to organize, to get out of town, to go into the forest. Okay, Sonia, so that, that was a clip from uh, 
our from our women in the partisans film that you are a very big part of, um, and as you know, you know a lot of um, a lot of people. Speaking of the essay contest, we have another question from Long Beach, and that you know on that the contest is about Jewish women partisans, uh, and it asks it answers really about new questions about courage and faith to survive. How did you change? after the partisans hmm. and after what were because you were still a young woman a little girl you know big girl young woman and how was it for you after how did you change okay mitch the thing is you're a young man how would you feel not to have any friends not to go to school not to be educated so you answer my question. How would you feel being liberated? Yes, but not to have any friends, nobody to talk to, nobody to be with and do things with. It's very lonely life, very lonely. I'm sure. Okay, I don't know what else to tell you. Well, a few more questions. Um, I know that you, know, you were one of a very small, relatively small number of Jews, you know, there were approximately 30,000 Jews who fought in, in partisan groups during the Holocaust, but millions of Jews resisted in, in other ways. In an interview we did together, you said that Jewish people fought back in every which way they could. What are other ways Jews resisted? I will you give about? you an example, which people might not understand. I had an uncle who was a rabbi, Moshe Schneers. He resisted by coming into the homes and teaching the small children the Bible and Hebrew. You know, once the assessment passed by under the windows and he heard such noise and he came on, he came in and he noticed the children and my uncle Moshe Schneas, who was teaching them. And of course, he took out the whip and whipped them all, and they were bleeding totally. So this, is a, this is the way they resisted, you know. And anyone who wanted to resist, they did not go to work. They, you, you've been caught to go to work in the ghetto, so you went to work, but you did not fulfill your quota or whatever. People did whatever they can. Not much was possible for Jews in the ghetto to do anything. Right. Um, you know, people resisted in, in, in many ways. Um, but there was still the perception that Jews did not fight back. And the, and, the, and the myth, right, that Jews went like sheep to the slaughter. Why do you think there was this... Why do you think people think that? That goes back many, 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 many years that they taught the Jews don't know how to fight and they will not fight back. The fact is, both my brothers are gone, fighting, not dancing. And a lot of friends who I had in the partisans were gone fighting. So why did they say the Jews don't know how to fight? You know, all right, this is a little different subject. Sure. Um, why do you think, because I know that we've talked about, you know, why is it important for young people to learn about the partisans? Why, why do you tell the story? Why is it important to you? It's important for many reasons. One of the reasons is that the children in the future should know that you could always fight back that you could always resist whatever they are putting out for you, anti-Semitism, racism, and all that. But unfortunately, we still have to fight. Right. We still have to fight. What is um? Thank, right, God, well, thank God for my country, Israel. I mean, my second country, my first country is, of course, America. 
But Israel is very important because since they um, they announced that Israel is a country, everybody looked differently on, on the Jews. They no longer made jokes that the Jews don't know how to fight. But uh, thank God for that. Sure. One more question. Last question. Because I know it's been a long morning. And we're all grateful for having you in your home. What message do you have for students today who are listening, who are looking at you right now in dozens of classrooms around the country? What do you want them to know? I want them to know not to accept anything that was dished out to them, like and racism, anti-Semitism, what other are things. They don't have to accept it. You have to find a way to fight back, whether organized or single, but you have to fight back. You cannot allow them to do anything that you cannot accept. Right. That is important. And the children have to learn. They cannot accept anything the government, the government or the organizations tell you to do. You have to fight back because you don't want the country to be different. You don't want d different organizations taking over. And, and so I'm very much for it that you have to fight back. Always you have to be on your toes all the time and, and, and um, be surrounded by people. And, and uh, you, you can't accept all these things. No. Um, th th thank you very much. I want to show one more clip, and then I want to say a few words. So please show one more clip, please. Made me feel very good. Made me feel proud of myself to be able to be a partisan, to be able to help in any way I was able to that mission to destroy the Nazi machine. made me feel very good, made me feel proud of myself to be able to be a partisan, to be able to help in any way I was able to that mission to destroy the Nazi machine. Made me feel... All right, well, I want to thank Sonia Orbach again for letting us into her. I wanted to enter her home today. Um, we are, uh, we're really indebted to Sonia and her family and her son, Paul, who's on our board of directors to make this really happen. Uh, I wanted to also just put in a last plug. Our writing contest has been extended to May 10th. Last year, we had 500 entries from 22 states. The winning teacher and their student both get an Amazon Kindle. It's for eighth to 12th grades. We hope that you will uh, participate. Finally, if you have any more questions for Sonia or about the partisans, you can email webcast at jewishpartisans.org or you can tweet JPEF webcast, J-P-E-F web, webcast, um, rather with a hashtag JPEF webcast. I wanna thank everyone for, for making this possible. This is our first webcast. We hope to be doing these about once a quarter. Have a nice afternoon.